Hey, hey everyone. We're just waiting everyone to tune in and then we'll start working on, on the track as well. Hey Jonathan, hey Robert, hey Jonathan, hey Matt, hey Prash, hey Tom. Glad to see everyone here. Thank you. Hey Cheese, how you doing? Hey Amado, how you doing? <laughs> it's time to relax. Let me know if the voice and the, the balance of the voice and the, the instrumental is okay. So it'd be really nice to know from you guys every, if everything is fine. Hey Kid Cat, how you doing? Hey Code Space. Sounds good, okay, awesome. I'm good and I'm I'm Happy that every, everything is fine. Hey, Andrew. Hey, Eli. Hey, Samuel. Lots of familiar faces over here, so I'm really happy to see everyone here. Hey, Brian. We're gonna start the live stream in about like two or three minutes, so just waiting for everyone. Hey, Rob. Hey, Alex, how you doing? So if you guys want to already, or while we rate everything, let me know what you want to see from this track. Uh, it'd be really nice, uh, so I can already go and, and talk a little bit about it. But l let me know in the comments what you guys want to see on this track. Hey Alex, hey Mora. I'm gonna replay the song over here. <laughs> hey Mix Warp. Hey Conrad, how you doing? Let's go again with it while we wait for a, a bit more people here. Conrad, we have 21 people live. Hey Nishu. Oh, it's Nicholas, how you doing? Hey Anthony, hey conductor, Mr. Will, how you doing? Lots of familiar faces over here, so I'm really happy to have everyone here. Hey, Castle, how you doing? <laughs> hey, Callum, how you doing? Okay, okay. So we we have some some requests on the on the lay on the layering of the the leads. We have some requests on the on the bass as well. Yeah, those guns are gonna stay put today. <laughs> Sound design of the lead, definitely. Show up your guns. That's the more I can do. <laughs> and I'm not ready for it. <laughs> Hey Gunjan, how you doing? <clears throat> hey 
Hey Federico, hey Alper. Oh yeah, there's some racing wheel over here. Yeah, that's the only little pleasure that I allow myself to. <laughs> okay, so should we start? Hey Freefall, how you doing? Drum bus. Okay, we have a lot of requests, so let's start because we have a lot of things to cover. And let's go. I have my comments over here, so if you guys have anything that I'm not saying that you want me to say, just go and just let me know here in the comments, and I'll start with it. Okay, so let me start here with the kick and bass relationship, and then we're gonna move into the leads, and then we're gonna move into the drums, and then we're gonna move into the pads and the break and everything. Okay, does that seem like something okay to you all, all you guys? So. Basically, um, as I said before in some of my videos, I don't like when I I don't, I don't like to make kicks. I don't look for kicks on sample packs. Probably this kick is from Volen Sentier. I have no idea which track I got it from, but all my tracks, uh, I just get the kick from I extract it from a from a from a track that is already there. Is that legal? You know, I, I'm I'm not really sure how to comment on that. You know, but at the same time, I'm I always do that, and like it's so hard. Like I'm never gonna get exactly the kick that, that the guy used. You know, so I'm definitely comfortable with doing this. And there's a video here, and we're gonna post it here whenever I edit this video here in the top right corner, that you'll be able to see how I do uh, all this extracting of the kick. It's available here in the channel as well, so you can definitely tune in and grab it over there. This kick is in G. This song is also in G. But I don't normally think about uh, the kick has to be in the same tune of the track. It doesn't, to me, that's not a thing. Because when I think about a kick, imagine you have a band, okay? So imagine you, you have a band and Coldplay is playing a show, 13 songs. Uh, they're going to tune the kick once and that's all. They're not going to tune the kick for each specific track. So the way that I like doing this is just look at tracks that are also in G or tracks that are also in the key of the track that you're doing. And then this way, you know where they put. And if they're putting like this and you've liked it, well, this is just an, a recipe for you to copy them and do the same way. Hey, Angelos. Hey, Jopi. Hey, f uh, f I'm a lot of people over here, you know, so I'm, I'm <laughs> thank you everyone for being here. But that's the way that I view kicks, you know, and normally my kicks, I don't like having them longer than one eighth, one eighth over here. I always try to get them a little bit shorter than one eighth because at least I have a lot of other room for the sub, which I always leave this part here for the sub. So that's normally what I, I like doing whenever I'm doing kick. And why do I do this? Because Normally, I like to leave this region whenever there's no kick, which is possibly like this. I like to leave it for the sub. And if you look at my sub, my sub, it's only a serum and nothing else. Like, honestly, nothing else. There is no effects, no nothing. Uh, there's an LFO two over here. And you can see that it's exactly that one eighth that I that I said before. And I also use this EQ over here. The only reason why I use this is because the sub is so low and without it, there's a little bit of a flickering that happens because of the LFO2. So this just gets rid of that flickering. That's the main reason why I do this. And that's why I love doing this way. Um, do you need to do this? No, you don't. And why do I have the, only the sub here? Because especially for this track, I, I decided to use the bass as a drone bass. So again, nothing fancy on the drone bass. Uh, I posted a video on how to make drone basses. And again, you can see here in the videos of the channel afterwards, or if you're watching this afterwards, you can see here in the top right corner. But basically that's the drone bass to me is simply by using a lot of detune and unison. That's basically what you got got to do. But again, the, th the thing here is that I'd already have a sub and you can see that I'm doing a cut 70 and below for the sub. And for the drone bass, I'm doing a cut 70 and above because I already have a sub over here. I don't need another sub over there. I recently learned a trick in which you can get rid of that first fundamental just by going here and excluding the fundamental. But I also prefer to do this because this way I 
I just cut everything out, off. Hi, Ian. Hi, Venloom. Um, and it's, it's pretty cool because this way I can control the different ranges of the bass. If you listen to everything, the, the bass and the, the drone, they're exactly the full bass that you're going to imagine. But uh, I can control the volume independently. If I said to you, if somebody says to me the sub needs to be louder, I just come here and lower and, and raise and lower the sub independently. It's just going to be a lot easier to me. Same thing is going to happen for the drone bass. If I need to raise this, it's going to be a lot easier and everything. But most importantly, another reason why I do this, especially when I'm using drone basses, um, the drone basses are really unstable. And if we take the side chain off, especially, you're going to hear that the notes here don't really, oops, the notes are really unstable. They go up and down. And I, that's the kind of thing that I don't want for my subs. I want my subs to be dead center and dead, like, let's li just listen to the sub now. But there you go, sub over here. Sub is one note and it's stable. And hey, DePaul, how you doing? It's going to be stable and all the notes are going to be at the same loudness. Leo, but why don't you compress the sub? Well, the signal is already compressed from the beginning. If you listen over here and I'm going to play a little bit, we're going to have to disable this. But if you listen to this and listen to this and listen to this, they're all the same loudness because it's already at the same loudness from the beginning. So I don't need to redo, re recompress anything. You know, that's my thought process on doing this. And you can see that I not only did one thing for the drones base, put a drone base in the in the drop, but I also did the same thing for the, the sub and drone base in the break. So that applies to not only this track, but applies to all other tracks. And I'm going to start posting a little bit more project walkthroughs over here. And you're going to see that sometimes I go even further and I have to I have another layer over there. So it's really cool to have control over everything. So I've talked about the volume th size of things. And the other, th other reason why I do this is because I don't need to be as aggressive with the side chain over here in my, in my drone bass as I am in my sub bass. Because, well, here, if you look at the kick, it's sub against sub. So here I'm talking about subs. But again, I don't have any sub over here. I don't have to be that aggressive with that. So because of that, I just... I'm a little bit more fluid with this, with the drone bass, and je that just makes the track be a little bit more fluid. If you listen to kick, sub, and bass, it feels like everything is glued together. Whereas if I had to do this and make this as the sub, it would jump a bit more. And that's the kind of fluidity that I like having. It's not jumping as much as I want. So that's exactly the kind of... of a feeling that I want for my for my my bases and everything. That's something that I have been doing for all my tracks. And literally I've been teaching this to my students as well. And it's something that it gives me control a lot. Of, that's another reason why I split everything. It gives me control over the volume of the side chain. Leo, but you can do this with Shaper Box. Yeah, quite it's not exactly the same. It works closely, but it's not exactly the same. So that's why I just split everything and just do it this way. Does that answer your question about sub free, subs, kicks, and everything? Let me know here in the comments if everything is fine. And then we can move into the layering of everything, into the arrangement of the song and other things as well in the project as well. Um, that's basically the, the, the way that I've been doing it. And I've been doing this for all my tracks. Like I'm just going to show here from recent tracks that I've been producing, you're going to be able to see the exact same process over here in which you'll be, you'll be able to see. Just, so I'm just showing that I'm not just preparing this for the project, but you're able, to, you're able to see the sub, the second octave, and the mid bass, as you've probably seen here me doing in other projects. Hey, Wesley, how are you doing? Um, again, just, just want to thank everyone from Sakura for this, for this live stream and also for the release. And again, if you have good songs, send it to them. Amazing label, amazing people over there. Definitely recommend it. But let's go back to the, to the, to the live stream. So basically, if we listen over here to the kick and bass relationship, as I told before, it gets everything more glued together, right? 
And <clears throat> what about the arrangement of the song? I'm pretty progressive whenever I'm doing my songs. And what I mean with pretty progressive, I like to think that every eight bar loop, something new has to happen. And I once went into one of the live streams from Sakura, and I remember Wesley saying that we can just stick to an arrangement that it's like a one minute drop, a one minute break, a one minute drop, not necessarily one minute, but drop, break, drop. And basically, uh, that's normally what I like to do. But what I always also like to do is that every eight bar loop, something new is happening. And something new is happening, not necessarily means that more stuff is happening. It can also be that every eight bar loop, something is being taken off as well. As for example, happens over here. You can see that nothing really happens from here to here, but you can see that the kick gets, gets taken out. So for example, So this is already the change that I wanted to do. And of course you can also do changes whenever you're thinking about just um, enhancing the cutoff and stuff like this, but every eight bar loop, something new has to happen. That's my thought process for everything. So again, if you listen to over here, it's pretty simple. I have this vocal ambience, which is pretty good. One important thing that I'd love to mention as well. Um, some people might ask me before on how I get the groove on some tracks. And some one thing that I always do, and I've talked about the sidechain of the, the, the basses, but technically most of the elements within my track are gonna be sidechained as well. Not gonna say all of them, but you can see sidechain over here. You're gonna see sidechain probably in the vocal as well. You're gonna see sidechain in some percussion in the shakers as well. Where's the sidechain? Here it is. You're gonna see sidechain in this one. Sidechain over here, sidechain in the toms, uh, not necessary, but possibly in the hi-hats. Most of the elements uh, I, I use sidechain because I like to have the same groove that I have in my bass within all, not all of the elements, but most of the elements. What varies though is I normally just copy a sidechain from one of the, the mid basses or the basses. And I then, then I just adjust a little bit like this. And normally over here with the depth, which is the dry wet. That's also something that I do it. Again, this is all according to the, to the, to the elements. So for example, pads, they're going to have a little less sidechain than the bass. You can see that now it's 58 over here. The main lead is probably going to have something a bit more aggressive. Not much, actually. 48, well, normally, I'd say and that, that's something that I, I, sometimes it's just, if it sounds good, it sounds good. There's no rule on doing, like, it has to be like this. And that's kind of one important thing to say as well. Um, swing on drums. Do I use swing on drums? Sometimes. Sometimes I use swing on drums. Uh, I normally don't. I normally use more swing whenever I'm, whenever I'm producing house music. But here is just, you can see there is a shaker here. It has 10 milliseconds of, de of delay, so it's a little bit offbeat. Um, but we'll talk about, you can see that we even enhanced the song by adding some elements over here. And now we're going to enhance it a little bit more by teasing a little bit of the lead. Why did I do this? Why did I add the lead over here? And why did I add the lead over here again? So um, a feedback from a, that I got from a guy from Anjuna was that some of my tracks weren't really, weren't really, um, teasing the listener up until the, 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 up until the midway through the break, you know, and I, one thing that I love doing, and also one thing that I, when I was talking to extra who is here in the, in the chat, he mentioned that, okay, he has a point because your, your lead only starts in the middle of the break. Maybe you could start your lead in the middle of the, the first drop, you take it away, then you come back with it. I always like to think that of elements, you can see that nothing happens from the beginning to the end. Everything comes and goes, comes and goes. No, no percussion stays till the end. 
no elements stay to the ends. Everything comes and goes. And this just hap just helps to keep the groove of the song, help to keep the, the listener interested on, on everything and making the song flow. Robert asked me, uh, do I use saturation in my percussions? No, I don't. I don't, I don't use... You can see that my processing is pretty simple, to be honest. I don't do much thing. Uh, the thing that I use the most is the Haas effect, which again has some problems. It could have some problems. So uh, understand that the Haas effect can cause some issues in the mono frequency. I don't use it for basses. Whenever I'm doing and trying to make uh, basses wider, I just use uh, a plugin called Wider from Infected Mushroom. This is it over here. Wait, no, VST3. Uh, Polyverse, boom, Wider. Free plugin, you can grab it and it's amazing. Um, do I use parallel compression in my drums? No, I don't use parallel compression. You can see that everything over here is loose. This is not the mixing project, but I'm not doing any compression or parallel, parallel compression in my drums, nor in the master chain. In my master chain here, I don't do anything. Whenever I'm creating, I'm not mixing nor mastering. I do do a little bit of mixing and mastering, but I don't use it all the time, okay? Uh, normally, whenever I'm, I'm, I'm mixing the track here, whenever I'm creating, it's I'm mixing to make it sound good. But the most important thing, whenever I'm creating, and I've just made another video about this recently, is that everything in the track, uh, until I finish their whole, the full arrangement, I'm just gonna go and do sort of brain dumps in the, in the, uh, to the song, just laying down the arrangement. And after I have an arrangement that I like, that's when I'm gonna start mixing and adjusting here and adjusting there and stuff like this. Of course, Whenever I'm producing, I just do a first drop. And after I do a first drop or a first break or a first or drop two, I do a little bit of a mixing, a little mixing for that specific session, just to make sure that that specific section sound great. After it, it sounds great. I just finish the whole track. And after I finish the whole track, that's only when I'm going to, to use, uh, to mix it again and everything. Am I a big user of return tracks? No, I don't use any return tracks. There, is, there are no return tracks over here. Everything that I do in terms of uh, room reverbs and stuff like this, there might be something over here directly on the channel. Like this is the room reverb that I'm using here. Just a little bit, nothing, nothing much. Do I do gain staging? Um, yes, gain staging is a lot of my mixing. I feel that my mixing is 80% gain, stage, gain staging. We're going to go into the mixing project afterwards, and then you can, uh, you can see how I mix everything. Because basically, I feel that this is the creation project. In the creation project, I'm not mixing. So after everything, I stem everything out, and then you can see it over here, for example. I'm going to bring here the mixing project. You can see all the stems from the track, and you can see here all the labels here. And then I bring this into another project and then I'm just going to work with audios and I don't want to work with any VSTs. I don't want to work with sidechain. It's already done. So it already makes it easier for me to get into the mindset of the mixing sta stage. Hey, Mr. Jung. Hey, Mr. Brave the Storm. Hey, Mr. Danny. Hey, Mr. Richard. A lot of people over here. Thank you so much. 40 people watching. Uh, right now so i'm really happy with this again thank you hey mr james how you doing and about the lead okay so we have a bunch of elements here in the song we have this piano but again one thing that i do is since i already have a bass here i already have this bass which is sort of the main element of the song right this drone bass over here i don't need another bass over here i don't need another sub so that's the starting point for everything you can see that especially the main elements. I'm going to do some sort of cuts over here around 150, 140, something like this, because I don't want it to have, I don't want to have this again. I just want to, uh, there's, it's already there. And this is how it is over here. And I might have done a little bit more tweaking in the mixing project as well, but essentially I'm going to do a low end, a low end cut, making room for everything in the low end, because again, there's already two main elements here in the low end. Okay. Talking about the lead. 
what is what is this lead over here so we have a couple elements here in the lead we have uh four elements to be honest we have i think that's this is one of the elements you can see that this is really stereo this is mono this is stereo i have this element over here which is the same just an octave up i have this one which is Again, sort of the same, but just a little bit more reverby. And I have this one, which I just put it, put it over there because I felt that it needed a little bit more presence in the sound. Why did I do this? Again, you can see the name of it over here. PL Mesalome. If you've been following the channel over here, I've covered this, this video here in one of my, my tutorials in which I t covered how to do the, the, the preset from Messalome's track. I think it's Magnolia. Someone asked me to do this one and I did it. And it's so cool that I said, okay, I'm just going to make a song with this. And, but at the time, I felt that I missed something else. And why am I layering over here? You can see that I have stereo. One layer in the stereo, right? Which is this one over here which complements this one. So it makes it wider and it also makes it something a little bit more mono. I also have this one to add a little bit more body and this one to complete the overall sound of it. Again, what do I do with the processing? You can see that there's not much going on. It's just presets that I've done and a little bit of EQing, taking a little bit of the low end over here and LFO too. An LFO 2 that to me, when I look at this right now and I'm like, hmm, maybe I could have been a little bit more aggressive with the LFO 2, but it sounds good and that's what matters, right? Um, and over here, you can see that there is not, not much happening. So it doesn't need to be that, you don't need to do that much aggressiveness with, um, with the sound in terms of making sure that everything sounds perfect. What I, what I view about layering, hey Larson, how are you doing? Uh, what I view about layering is mainly, I want to have something stereo, I want to have something in mono, I want to have something to give a little bit of body to the sound. Imagine a game of tic-tac-toe. So I'm just gonna open here one whiteboard so we can draw here. Imagine a game of, game of tic-tac-toe over here. You have your mids, your low end, mid and high end, I normally like to fill everything up over here, the mids and the highs, and normally something like this. So in the mid range, normally stereo and mono. In the high range, normally stereo and mono as well. In the low range, a little bit more here in the, in the more, more focus on the mono, okay? And it's mainly thinking about this with everything that I do. So. If there's a lot of content in the mono field because there's already a lead, I'm going to start putting some elements out of the mono. And I'm already answering Federico what he said about how do I feel about loss of, of, of mono information when mixing. Sometimes I want this. Sometimes uh, in the motto, I feel that the, the plugin you're talking about is Visual Mixer from Isotope. It's kind of like this, but I'm just like doing it independently for all the channels. So for example, you might see here that, let's see if I have something. I have this white noise layer over here, which does exactly what the main lead is doing. But you can see that I'm using a house effect over here because I want to fill up the, mo the stereo frequencies over here. I want to fill that high end, which is this part over here. And I want to fill with just noise. That's mainly what it is, you know, without it, just so you can listen in context. It's just a little bit of, of, of positioning here and there, something in the middle, something in the stereo. Just one thing, let me know if you guys think that the sound of my voice and the, 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 the studio is fine, everything is, is okay in terms of loudness. If I need to raise something, let me know here in the comments if it's not, okay? And yes, uh, Code Space mentioned, yeah, there's so little uh, uh, processing. I don't like processing because the more you do, the more you have to remember that you're being done, that you, that you did, right? So 
I just feel that the I just try to do the less I can whenever I, whenever possible. Um, so bottom line, uh, let me just see the Federico. Bottom line for you is that it's not bad to when you lose a bit of mono information. No, it's not bad when you lose a bit of mono information because, for example, um, sometimes you want this because sometimes you want to take some stuff out of the mono frequency, raise the volume of the of the the project a tad. So I'm gonna raise it in one dB over here. Let me know if this is better. Hello, 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 hello. Just testing. Hello, hello, hello. Hello, hello, hello. Is it better right now? Let me know here in the comments below. And about about the 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 processing. Okay, way better. Awesome. About the processing, the less you do, the less you have to remember. And again, as just going back to my mixing stereo and and mono, more. Um, Oh, good. Okay, awesome. People, people like it this way. So <clears throat> I'm gonna try not to speak whenever this is playing. Okay, so this way you guys can listen as well. But sometimes some things I wanted to put in stereo. For example, let's talk about drums. What? How do I feel? How do I? Uh, I see my drums. So I have this hi hat over here, which is pretty aggressive in the mono. So why would I put my my shakers in the mono as well? Can you listen how everything gets clamped up together when it, every, the shaker and the hi-hat is in a mono? But when I put the, the, the shaker in the stereo, you can listen to the shaker better and you can listen to the hi-hat better as well. So sometimes I want to lose mono content in that shaker because I, don't, I want it to put it exactly in the stereo field. And I do this, for example, to this continuous hat as well. I'm not doing this with a Haas effect, but I'm doing this with an auto pen. This is mono, but now I'm shaking left and right, left and right, left and right. Again, this is just a way to make not only make the sound wider, the song, the full song wider, but also to make the everything more balanced throughout the whole song, you know. So I love doing this. I do it all the time. And for example, hi-hats additionals. These are mainly elements to add to the hi-hat, just so you can listen. It's just some slight stuff to add a little bit more to the song and, and make sure that we, it, it, again, something new is happening and it's not the same thing, just so you can listen in context. Without it. Without. It just has a little bit of groove here. The Bomer Pluck, uh, Eli mentioned, yeah, the Bomer Pluck is something that I feel that... Oh, it's in my pack, actually. And it's called Göttingen because uh, I think that's, that's the city that Ben Bomer was, was born. So that's normally how I named everything in that pack. But yeah, it's just because it reminds me of, of Bo uh, Ben Bomer. And it's just doing some... Here's another thing, do you use loops? Yes, I do use loops. Um, but this loop was probably not, I, I tuned it a lot over here. Uh, especially for percussions though, I think that everything here was from a loop. Not sure. But normally when I'm not sure what I want to do with percussion, I just throw a bunch of loops over there and then I start cutting them to something that I like. Because instead of using the full loop, I'm going to be able to, to individually select the elements that I like within that loop instead of just using the full loop. Because again, the full loop just seems a little bit like, uh, you know, like I feel like cheating a little bit. One thing that it's really important in my tracks, and I use it all the time, are these ambiences over here. These are like mainly from Lanikia. Okay. You can see that. And one thing, this follows the same principle. Instead of using just one loop, I use three because now that it's three, nobody's going to be able to know where, where it's coming from. Well, now you know because you can see it here. But one thing that I do that's really important for this sound, it's actually doing this... Uh, this it's this rack over here 
this whole thing just makes it all ethereal. So, especially here in the break, if you turn it off, it just loses a little bit of of that stereoness in the sound, that the ambient sound in the vibe. So, uh, in the sound. So, I just like using them to add a little bit more of stereo feel in the sound. Um, Conrad asked me, some of your progressive looks like in audio, some in MIDI. Any method to, to that method? Oh, so I hate stuff in MIDI. This is only, the only one that I use in MIDI because it's a drum rack that I got from Julian Gray, if I'm not. Yeah, I think that that's um, instruments, Julian Gray. Where is the drum machine over here? It's something like this. Drum machine. Probably in the samples. Julian. Great. And where did I get it from? I honestly enter one of his live streams and loved what he's doing. And I just copied and added to my projects. <laughs> um, but I hate doing stuff with MIDI for percussions. I like to see them. So you can see here that most of them, 90% of them will be in stereo, in, in audio. Normally everything is in audio because this way I can see what I'm, what I'm doing. And not only this, but I can see where they're hitting and I can compare with, okay, there's nothing hitting over here. So if it, there's nothing hitting over here, I can put something that complements that percussiveness of the sound. So this is just, just a way to, to make it easier to me again, to, to, I, I, I honestly forgot, forget really quickly about stuff. So if I honestly forget really quick about stuff when I'm producing, it's better to have less stuff and better to be more organized. And whenever I, I was doing the video for this, Jopi, who is the, one of the members of Sekora, he mentioned to me like, wow, your projects are really organized. And again, it's not because I want to be organized. It's because I have to be organized because otherwise it'd be a complete mess and I wouldn't know where everything was. So. Whenever I'm producing, all my projects have the same labeling. They have the same coloring as well. Everything that's vocal, it's in red. Everything that's effects is in white. Everything that's in black is bass. Everything is in blue is melodic stuff. But light blue is break. Uh, dark blue is drop. Leo, but there are some break elements over here. Yeah. What starts in the drop goes to the drop. What starts in the break remains in the break over here. Sometimes it just happens that I completely take it off afterwards. Um, basically, a lot of, a lot of, and, and again, percussions are always yellow. And if you see any of my projects, everything is going to be like this. It's just going to be a lot easier for me because this project I started in may last year so i know exactly what everything is happening because everything is labeled correctly and everything um more questions so i remember there was a question about the lead there was a question about transitions from robert so let me go about this transitions um now i just want to send over some <laughs> um Transitions. I, I pay a lot of attention to transitions. I use a lot of effects. So I use a lot of these white noise effects. Where is the white noise effects over here? I use a lot of these. I use a lot of white noise here. And then sometimes I use these kind of sweeps as well. Why? they help a lot with transition. So I'm just going to take it off. Here, we're starting something and it doesn't feel really connected to whatever was coming uh, before, right? If we add these transitions, now somehow it feels like it's connecting. Somehow I feel like everything is connecting. And that's the main reason why I love using these elements. Sometimes I go really far with them. Just for example, I'm just going to bring something from a project that I'm working on right now. So you can see how far can I go with transitions. So this is something that I've worked on two days ago. And I'm going to bring the effects chains over here. Just so you can see how far I go sometimes with the effects. But I'm really big on them. And 
do I do I change them all the time? No. I you can see that there's the same best ever uh, that I use it all the time. Um, but you can see that there's a lot of white noise and a lot of effects going on over here in that song that I'm working on. Hey, Anthony, how are you doing from Australia? Uh, um, so I use um, a lot of transitions. Do I get my samples from Splice? Um, yes, but not technically the same way as people get it because I do a lot of work for Splice. So I get a lot of my samples working for them. So basically that's how I get a lot of samples. And because here in Brazil, uh, we have a lot of like, everything is times five. We, we exchange a lot of packs. Uh, but honestly, the pack that I use the most are Cashmere's pack. So if I had to recommend you packs, Cashmere's either one, one, two or three. Sample magic stuff, amazing stuff. Sounds Fat also has some amazing stuff. I, they have a pack called Psychopladia One, which is really good. And it's coming. The new pack from me is also coming soon. So there'll be a lot of samples over there, a lot of effects, a lot of everything. So it's coming. And oh, keeping on with transitions. Another thing that I love doing, and you can see it over here, whenever there's a, a section change coming, I normally do these kinds of, of, of bass cuts as you can listen to them over here. I'm just going to point it out so you can listen as well. Listen how the basses are going to be a little bit faded and filtered from the beginning. Okay. Why do I do this? Well, I filter these basses because I'm going to a section where the bass is a lot quieter. So I don't want to have, I'm just going to do them without this. Can you see the, the, the big volume change that we have from the one section being really big with the bass and one section not being big at all with the bass? So by doing these cuts, I'm making sure that, let me go back here to the whiteboard. I'm making sure that, let's imagine that this is the bass level and this is the break bass level. So by doing these fades over here, I'm just gonna paint this differently. So I'm doing a little bit of a fade over here in the EQ. Okay, so this is EQ. I'm making sure that the volume of the bass is going all the way down and meeting something over here instead of going like this. So transitions to me, it's all about smoothing what you, you're going to do next. So if you know that you're going to start with an ARP over here, for example, which is a totally different example, you're going to start with an ARP MIDI over here why not start with it over here and filter it in like you can do a, a low end filter you can have your spectrum over here and you have a, a filter like this boom make it go from here to there do an automation like this boom, and then it goes all the way from here it's all about smoothing it out what's coming next and i like to think that instead of doing something like this which is whatever ends over here starts something new over here try to do something like this that this section already starts a little bit over here. I do this all the time. And to me, transitions, it's all about that. It's about non, it's about making what's coming next, next less drastic to the listener. So again, if I didn't do this and I didn't have any of these effects, listen to how it would sound like. Now with it, I chain again over here and EQ over here again. Can you see how it's smoothed out it gets? And that's what we're looking for over here. We're just making sure that whatever is coming next will come next smoothly. That's what we want. That's, that's, that's how I view its transitions. Okay. I know that there's a lot of people that do it differently and a lot of people wouldn't agree with me. Um, having these effects all the time. But the way that I think, and I come from a band background, uh, I used to, to play punk rock and I used to listen to a lot of punk rock. Every eight bar loop, every change of section, there is a So if they can do it, why can't I? It's part of like this, that I, the way that I think. 
but again, you don't have to do it. Okay. Another thing that I love doing to intensify transitions are, can you see how the kick going to have a little bit of some, some small breaks before every eight, eight bar loop end. Oops. Let me just do it like this. So just listen to how it sounds like there's a small little break over here. To me, it anticipates that something new is coming. Okay. I'm going to come here and do this so you can listen how it would sound like without this. It works the same, but it's just something that I like doing and just something that I love. Uh, I, uh, you can, if you go to my tracks, all of them are going to have this. Okay. And again, normally I love doing bridges as well because bridges is like, I'm, I, I don't really want to go that aggressive in the transition from A to B. So I'm doing an A, B section in which I'm already starting to do um, something that's going to start in the break. But as uh, Nietzsche seven over here said, Zen world hates those mini breaks without something happening. It's from, from listener to listener. It, it, it's from, from producer to producer as well. It's going to vary among all producers. So this is not the formula for how you should produce, but this is just how the way that I do it. And I hope you're taking some insights from it. So this way you can apply it to your projects as well. Um, what else guys? Well, what else do you want to know? Let me shoot down some questions over here so we can answer, or we can definitely move here to the mixing project as well. So you can see what happens next when I just finish over here. Um, yeah, let me know here in the, in the comments. So I'm going to wait a little bit for you guys to shoot some questions. And if I haven't answered anything that you've asked me before, let me know here and I'll answer right now. Someone asked me about the pads. Oh yeah. Someone asked me about the pads and the breaks. Pads and the breaks. Uh, what do I love using here? Elements that I love using here in the break, uh, during breaks are one note strings. Okay. Strings. Um, pads, but you can see that I don't add any pads over here. Do I add any pad? And sometimes ARPs. Why ARPs? You can see that again. Remember what I said about transitions, start your ARP in the last bit of the drop. So it already blends in with the break. That's exactly what I'm doing here. Why ARPs in the breaks? Well, someone said to me once, uh, imagine when you're, you're at the club and in a break, when you have an ARP, it's when people are going to do like with their hands, you know? So I was like, you know, I'm going to have them over here and I always have them in my tracks. I try to do them in my tracks, not necessarily always have them. How do you make decisions about what elements to take away from the eight bar loop variations? I learned to produce with trends and I'm stuck with the always build mentality. So it's hard to cut sometimes. Yeah, I'm, I'm always build mentality as well. Whenever I'm in the drop, I'm always building. You can see that more, more, more percussive, percussively more over here, more over here, uh, same thing over here, more over here, and then more over here, but it always goes up to the, it depends on your arrangement. If you have an arrangement that it's six or seven, eight bar loops, that means that you're going to have to add seven new elements. If you have four, you're just going to have to add three. Okay. Because one, two, three, right? Not because of this. So that's exactly, uh, exactly the way that I, I feel about, about these transitions. You know, it's always to, to make sure that, sorry about additions. I'm always adding. And then I take them out in the end of the section. If you don't like you're, if you're always building and you don't know where to stop, maybe you have to look into your arrangement and maybe you have to ground your arrangement a little bit better. Okay. And Nisha, don't worry. I'm not, I know that it's not a critique and, and it's, it's just a, a way that people do is everything. Right. And Freefall asked me, do, uh, what is your master track in breaks? 
do you use stereo field or reduce dbs before the drops yes i do both and we're going to the master project in a bit and i'm going to show them my master chain and i'm going to show all my mixing channels as well um what do i use for arps arps mainly what i love using for well i use serum all the time you can see that serum it's like all all over the project right it's serum all over the project um i remember that this project was something that i was like i'm gonna make a song only with my packs and i don't mean to 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 make a, a commercial thing but you can grab it, them here in the description i'm gonna put it afterwards or in the top right corner if you're watching the replay but they're always serum okay all serum there's a bunch of presets over here that you can grab for free in the channel as well you don't have to pay for anything and there's a bunch of uh, of sounds that i just love um it's all serum you can see here this one it's serum this one over here it's also serum the way the the way the name the name arp cloud it's because it reminds me of a producer friend which is called fur cloud and it's an arp so i was like arp cloud and that's the name of it so fur cloud if you're watching it <laughs> that's for you um but they are all serum okay and normally pl plucks it's just a normal simple pluck over here if you can listen i'm gonna put it in a more aggressive this is from the pack that i've done you can see that it's just a saw nothing else i'm honestly amazed that it's just a saw because i don't remind it being only a saw um but mainly that's the kind of thing that uh that i do for 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 progressions like i honestly just go to my, the packs that i've i've done and just go through there's a lot of presets like i'm working on several packs at the moment so it's just going through the stuff that i've have that i have and i and i i go from there okay um there's a question so that's your an answer for you ian uh always just go to go to plux and you'll find something over there shander asked me kind of topic but how do you go about produ uh, producing with intention of getting a vocal top line so if you're producing thinking that you're gonna have a top line afterwards it has to feel empty it has to feel like something it needs something else there's a song that i'm making here it's a house music project and when i'm i'm sending to producers they're all always like dude this is really good but it's missing something and that's exactly the kind of answer that i want because if it's perfect as an instrumental maybe it's a bit too crowded when the vocal comes in if you want to keep it this way you have to open up space with the mixing because either you're going to open up open up space with elements or you're going to open up space with mixing um hey contra how you doing oscar asked me how long did it take you to finish that song so let's go here into the project so I started this in May 8th, 2021, uh, and I probably ended it over here. So it took me a month and a half. This is June 21st. And then I revisited the project like eight months later because I was like, oh, you know what? I just want to release this and I love the way it sounds and I, I want to found a label. And Sikora reached out to me and I was like, I like the sound, so I'm gonna, I'm gonna send them this song because I felt it could be appropriate. And they loved it, but it took me around, yeah, a month and a half. I'm not exactly how long, but I, if I would estimate something, I would say around 10 to 20 hours, something around this, it depends, okay? Uh, yes, Sekora reached out to me, a model. Uh, uh, Greg, which is one of the ARs, he reached out to me, and which came exactly where I wanted to reach out to them. So it was just a perfect combination. Uh, what's the sound is what's the sound design look like for pads? Always struggle with coming up with something interesting. So if you wanted to look uh, for, for pads, I'd made a video recently that again I'm gonna put in the description in the top right corner. I believe the top right corner it's over here right now. Um, I'm going to put it over there, but normally pads, it's, you have to make something with a lot of, of, of release. So if you listen to this pad over here, for example, there's a lot of movement over here because this, oh, this one is automating the sound, but these are just two saw waves, probably 
the detune is coming from this over here. This is minus 10. This is plus 10. So if you, I'm going to put this in zero and zero over here as well. This wobbliness kind of creates a little bit of the stereo sound to it. Because I'm, de I'm not detuning here with the unison, but I'm detuning it with the fine. So it's almost the same thing as the detune, okay? Um, and normally that's how I do uh, my pads, okay? I just, if you want to do pads, if you had to do something from scratch over here, initial preset, detune, always put the release up and you can just have a lot of effects, but you can see that the ethereal can come a little bit from adding a little bit of reverb. You can see this already sounds like a pad, right? And you can already enhance this with more elements. So for example, maybe a mellow but unstable and more detune here. We've made a pad and that's it. Okay. Um, the high EQ boost and then EQing it away. I'm going to go into that again. So do you use silent for pads, arps for, for serum? No, everything is serum nowadays. Everything is serum. I just like, I honestly, when I go back to silent, I'm like, I'm not even sure how to use this, but I, I still remember, but, but not really. How do you get the breakdown to build up so nicely to the main drop without overdoing it? So again, it's normally just getting one thing that is important here is that whenever I'm doing my tracks and I always try to have different kind of progressions in the first part of the break than afterwards. So this is the progression of the drop as you can see it over here. I'm just going to grab this so you can see it. If I put this over here, it's the same progression as this one. This one has more notes, but it's the same progression. And in the break, I always like to have a different progression than what I had in the song. The reason why I'm doing this is I want the listener to go into another journey. I don't want them to listen to the same thing all the time. So I always try to do a different progression over there. And Cold Space Serum is not intimidating. You just have to go into it. Um, <clears throat> but going back here, so how do I transition first of all into this section to the buildup probably there's an impact over here some effects but it's all about adding tension course we, we we tweaked a little bit of the pad so it's not gonna work as it was um, it's all about adding tension and I do a lot of this with endless Mayo over here which is a plugin that you just have one knob and you just tweak the 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 knob to create a little bit more tension as you can listen over here what is an endless Mayo I, I just grabbed the pack from uh, what is the name of this guy Audio effects. This is from John Grand. So basically, it's the same effect as this over here. It's just adding tension. And if you look at the, the chain that he's using over here for the... Is it this, this one? Yes, this is the one. So effects that he's using over here. Uh, not this one. What is happening here? Uh, possibly this one. I don't know. I just got this one. So I'm still understanding all over here, but oh, there's, this is the one. So it's just a bunch of filtering, low pass filtering, sometimes reverbs, delays. That's mainly it. You just have to build tension into the sound. So again, sometimes I have risers over here and you can see that I don't even have a, a drum fill in the sound. It's just without, just like building tension. Normally I do some sub frequencies cuts. The pack.
pad is like that because of the of the that we changed it but normally it's just about about having a lot of 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 how can i say uh just a lot of, of elements, but I make sure to filter them up whenever the, the, the drop is coming. So the impact of the drop is a little bit bigger. You can see that it's going to filter the low end a little bit. People are asking what's in the master. So let's go and poke the bear and let's go into the mastering project and into the mixing project. Now, going into the mixing project we're gonna go here and look everything that it's here i'm not gonna first hey into the ether how you doing um if you want to know how everything in my master chain there's a video up here that you can also see everything that i'm doing in my master chain you can see that remember what i said about everything being in st in in stems over here Sometimes I make additions, but I normally don't. Uh, the reason, and again, if you see it over here, first person, a lot of people ask me, do I do some parallel compression in the drums? No, I don't. Here, you can see that the drum bus, it's like this. And if you see the percussions, they're probably just going to have reverb, EQ, a little bit of gating, and especially volume out of, you can see how I'm, I change the volume all the time. So Jonathan asked me, what do I do? Do I do a lot of gain staging? Uh, and yes, a lot of gain staging. You can see that four and a half here, a half, three and a half, five and a half. And it all depends according to the reference tracks that I'm listening at the moment. So extra, remember that I said to you, then you helped me, you helped me again with this one being a reference track for this one um bump on the master chain so let's go into the master chain right away what do i use in the master chain everything is over here and i'm gonna go through every element so there is a an eq cut over here okay first of all i make sure to put this input gain so everything that is coming into the master just so you can understand the thought process of the project here all the blue go here to the drop elements and this drop goes to the master and the same thing happens to here this goes to the drums and this goes to the master this kick and sub kick and bass now goes into the kick and bass group and this goes into the master i don't do any bus processing but if i wanted that's why i have this over there and if i go here i have my input which is basically just turning all the song down in adb um what is the headroom that I work with? Well, it doesn't really matter to me. As long as it's not clipping, that's what matters to me. I don't want any channel to clip. And again, I just make sure to use this. For example, let's say you send me a song with minus one dB of headroom. I'm just going to come here and put minus five. So I have six dB of headroom. So it doesn't really matter as long as it's not clipping to me. Okay. What matters to me is actually this compressor. I'm going to go back to everything before, but this level that I set over here, after it goes through everything, it has to be compressing 2 dB over here. And that's where I know that I'm at the right point. Okay? It's by looking at the compressor and how much of compression it's happening. And not by the actual levels of everything. Okay? But again, I make sure that everything is not clipping. Going back, uh, there's a low cut filtering over here. No, laden uh, no linear phase. This is zero latency. Why? Uh, I test, I always test on and off, and sometimes I, I prefer off uh, than on. Um, and I also know that whenever you're using linear phase, it also adds a little bit of, uh, it's not distortion. It's, there's a pre-ringing effect that it, it happens because of the look ahead of the, of the linear phase. And this is a 96 dB cut because I don't honestly don't want anything over here. This is just noise that we're not going to listen to. Okay. OTT, 10% of OTT, and that's it, nothing else. Okay. I've already asked Mauro Levy, which is a producer from Anjuna, and he said, your master chain is amazing, but this is something that I wouldn't do. Um, I do it slightly. It's just 10 dB, 10% uh, of multiband compression. There's a lot of people who use it a lot more. And again, sometimes it's tested on and off. And the reason why I leave it there, even though there are people who say, mm, not the best to me, when I, when I do a blind test, I'm like on off, on off with my eyes closed, 
I always prefer it on than off. So if it sounds better on, why take it off, right? Then I go to do uh, 18,048 dB cut. And why do I not do it over here? Why do I do it over there? Cheers, Arilax. Hope you like the live stream. Um, why do I do it over there? M um, practice, a habit, sorry. So it's just something that I've been doing and it's just some the way it is. Um, but 18,000, we barely listen to this. So that's, I always do a, a cut like this. Sometimes I do a 12 dB, but normally I do a 48 dB, okay? Four times means four times 12. Automation over here, this is just putting 6 dB down because I want after everything, I'm just bumping this 6 dB further down, okay? So when it hits the compressor, I'm sure that this will not be clipping, okay? Because before it used to be clipping and that's why I added this 6 dB, this additional 6 dB to make it not clip. So over here, we have this compression over here. I aim for two to uh, around 2 to 4 dB of compression. So now it's going to be a bit louder over here. I'm going to put this a bit quieter and you guys are going to have to give some impressions if this is too loud or not. Let me know in the comments if this is okay or not in terms of loudness. I'm going to keep on talking so you guys can let me know. Yes, no, yes, no. It's fine. Okay, perfect. So now that we have it over here, you can see that this is compressing 2 dB, but in the main drop, it's probably going to be compressing a bit more. So the only thing that I change over here is the threshold. Sorry, it's the it's the input gain because this remains like this. And with the input gain, I control how much of the sound is going through that compressor. That's how I don't mess with anything else. All my tracks are like this slow attack. Fast release, 40 dB of ratio. Why like this? I honestly, nowadays, I use it because I already tried with less and more attack. Always liked it with less attack because this way I'm letting the peaks through and this sounds a bit better. So if you listen to this, Basically, I'm capturing the trend, the, 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 tr uh, I'm keeping the transient exactly as Federico said, you know, and a release. I don't want to come a fast release. I don't want to compress anything that doesn't need to be compressed. Basically, that's it. Okay. Uh, there is a side from code pen compression visualizer. I think that's, that's the one, not this one compression visualizer. Old pen, yeah, this one is better because it's full screen. Basically, I have a slow attack and a fast release with a 4 dB ratio. So I'm letting the peaks through over here, but I'm compressing whatever needs to be compressed. If you look at it like this, whenever something doesn't need to be compressed, it stops compressing, but I'm letting peaks through a lot more. Just so I'm giving a visual cue of what I'm doing, okay? Going back over here, then I have an imager. This imager is always like this, always. I don't change the frequencies. I don't change anything else. It's always like this. Leo, why don't you adapt the, the frequencies to uh, the frequencies of your song? I've tried that. And again, I always do blind tests whenever I'm trying something new in the master chain. And I've tried adjusting the, to the, according to the, to the frequencies of my song. And I've tried with this one as it is. And I liked it better as it is. It, again, it's whatever sounds best. Okay. This is the standard ozone uh, frequency. So 200, 850 and 12K over here. And I don't do anything over here. In the, hi Luca, how are you doing? Uh, in the bound to divide forum on Discord, um, there was a question about like making the sub frequencies mono. And you can see here that I don't do anything here to the band one. Uh, I don't put every, anything in mono. There, there is no mono maker in my song. Why there is no mono maker in my song? Because everything is already mono from the root. All the channels that need to be mono are already mono from there. I'm not making anything else mono that doesn't need to be mono. Basically, that's it. So what, what is mono? The kick, the sub, 
The kick is mono. The sub is mono. But I can make this bass mono. Because the cool about the, the cool sound of it is the stereo part of it. So if I make this mono, it probably can change how it sounds. So that's not what I want. Um, continuing here. So Freefall asked me a question. Do I do volume automations and stereo automations before the drops? Yes. So there's a little bit of a volume automation before every drop. And there's a little bit of a stereo automation before every drop as well. Again, how can you make a drop more impacting? You just make what's preceding it less impacting. So how can you make this seem more, oops, how can you make this seem more pink? You just put a brown thing right, right next to it and this by contrast seem more pink. That's kind of what I'm doing. I'm making my, my drop seem, seem more impactful by making the, la the, the parts that precedes the drop less impactful. So if you listen without, oops, all the way. And over here. The drop slightly, uh, slightly hits a little bit more aggressive and that's exactly what I want to do for the song. That's exactly, I want to have a more aggressive drop. This over here is if I want to do section uh, leveling. What is section leveling? If I want my uh, drop one to be a bit louder than the intros. Again, I only like, uh, I only do this, for example, in terms of sections. And I always think about, um, my kick has to be at the same level throughout the whole track. So if I'm raising this section in 1.5 dB, I'm gonna have to raise all the other sections that have a kick and are drops in 1.5 dB as well. Not necessarily the intro, not necessarily the outro, but I want to have a consistent kick and bass throughout the whole track, okay? What I normally do is sometimes I make my intros quieter, sometimes I make my outros quieter as well. Again, by making the intro quieter, I make the drop louder and more impactful, okay? And then we go to the last bit of, of, of the master chain, which is the maximizer. And again, I've tried a bunch of maximizers. I've tried um, L2 from Waves, I've tried AOMs, I've tried Fab Filters, I've tried... Uh, there's a lot more from Waves, there's a lot more from... Even Ableton's. And honestly, the best one that the best result that got to me was this one with this kind of setting. So again, is this the best one to you? Not necessarily. It depends on what you want. It depends on what you're aiming for. Um, I think that it was Arilax over here that said some producers using G-Clip plugin to master to reduce the clipping. Some producers use clippers to give that last touch over there in the mixing and that's true and I don't like you can see that throughout the whole project there wasn't one single distortion plugin I hate not hate I don't like distortion there's some cool th sounds of distortion um like th there's one plugin that I really like from baby audio which is really cool which is this TAIP which is tape uh it's really nice um, and it, it gives some really analog sounds. Thermal is also really cool, which is from output, if I'm not wrong. And also there's this one from, uh, they don't have it yet, but sound toys have decapitator, which is amazing. Fab filter has the pro the Saturn, which is amazing as well. Um, Shander, you can always watch the replay, right? It's going to be here. And again, it doesn't, it doesn't, I've never tried a TDR's limiter, but I like to, to use this one and that's the one that I use all the time. Do you master to, to a certain luffs level afterwards? No, I master to, I don't use metering whenever I'm mastering. Like I do pay attention to this Swiss army knife over here, which basically give me luffs. Uh, it's from these guys over here, Nor Labs. It's really cool. So if you if you haven't checked it out, it's really cool. It's for Ableton only, 
but it basically gives everything nothing that the guys from Yulian are not doing okay so and also there is another one I think this DP meter is also another one which is pretty good and it does the same thing okay um, but I'm always mastering to something that I love less to how can I say comparing to my reference tracks I have to be at the same loudness as them that's the way that I put it and I don't go with levels I go with my ears for that sense uh, same thing for the mixing same thing for for a lot of of other elements I use a lot of referencing, but I don't use AB metric, okay? Um, no, I don't do it by year. I do a lot with this over here with from Ozone. Because with the Ozone equalizer, basically I get myself understanding if I... I don't use this to take action. This basically is, is a guide. And again, there's a video here in the top right corner that's probably over here that you can see. Uh, I'm going to link this afterwards, but... Match EQ, it's really big for me because it can give me a guide on what I have to do and where I have to tweak next and everything. So it's really cool. It's a really cool plugin. You can see that I don't use it to get 100% in line exactly because I don't know what section is this. But if you listen to this song over here, oops, let's just take this from here. I probably did some tweaking. Oh yeah, the tape over here, right? And reference. Can you see how it sounds at the same loudness? That's what I aim for. But let's go to the mastering chain. Ceiling, really important, okay? I always put 0.15 of ceiling, which is basically that my songs are always hitting 0.15 over here. Right now, you can, see, you can see that it hits minus 5.16 because we have a minus 5 over here. So always 0.15. Why? When you convert wave to MP3, there could be there could be some distortion and there could be some artifacts that is introduced in the sound. And this could introduce a little bit of noise, which can put your 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 volume here a little bit up. So I always make sure to put it to 0.15. Um minus 0.15 let's go back threshold is basically until i find the point where it's at the same loudness so this is nothing that i i go exactly at minus 14 it's this is at the same loudness as my reference track and basically that's it if i was referencing this one over here which is a bit quieter So it depends from track to track, okay? That's important to mention. Fast character over here. Uh, why do you want a fast character over here if you want a, a, a slow character over here? The way that I see it is that now I want to make sure that everything is, ca is caught at the same pace, okay? I'm not looking for trends anymore. I'm looking for the whole wave of sound at the moment. Um, and already done what I needed to do here in the trends with the compressor, okay? Not only this, but whenever I put it to slow, it sounds awful. So that's always why I use this one. Um, so maximizer introduces saturation whenever you're putting, you're, you're doing more than you can, okay? Uh, or whenever you have a problem in your mix, it can introduce some saturation. So it's not the mix and master thing. It's, it's not the mastering uh, plugin that's causing the saturation. It's either a, a wrongdoing in the mixing or you're just going too much, okay? Uh, yes, Contra, the stream is going to be archived, so you will be able to watch it later. In the same link that you, you have this for this one. Um, I should have been recording it, but I'm not. Uh, so it's only going to be here in the archive. Um, lastly, uh, oh wait, not here. I'm going here. We have this stereo independence. Stereo independence basically it's saying that the left here is going to be 100% independent from the right. So if it needs to be uh, max, so if it needs to be limited in the left, but not in the right, it's only going to limit the left and not the right. Just one independency over there. Uh, fly by Scott's free. I'm going to answer to your question. Okay, one sec. Uh, transient emphasis controls the amount of emphasis given to transients. I've read the manual. It doesn't give any comment on that. It just says that it makes the 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 
the transients sound a little bit better. So that's why I always put it all the way up. It takes a lot of your CPU though, okay? And my computer can handle it. So that's the positive to me. Uh, but that's as far as they explain, probably some algorithm from them that they don't want to share. Um, Isotope, if you're watching, put it here in the comments below what it is, okay? Well, I'd love to know as well. Uh, but basically it makes your transient a little bit cleaner from what I listen, okay? But it's really, really, really slight. And I also put it to three, two picks again to prevent clipping uh, in the analog domain. That's the mastering chain. And in the master, like you might say to me, okay, but you're just uh, doing a lot of stuff over here. You can see that everything is just EQ, some endless mile, which is just creating some tension. There's a bit of track spacer over here, basically creating space from something to someone else. Uh, my track spacer pro uh, thought process is what is the main element, the lead. So probably everything over here, this uh, element is being track spaced by the lead. If you don't know what track spacer is, basically it's a, it's a dynamic, imagine a side chain, but imagine a side chain for a specific region of your spectrum. That's basically it. Okay, and I'm only doing for this main, uh, this region about 18%. I don't go as far as 13%, okay? Um, over here, I'm giving a boost in the lead without this in the mix, without it, with it. I'm boosting a lot of the highs. I'm doing a lot of volume changes over here. So you can see it all relies on volume to me. Volume, EQ, reverb, and that's it. There are no compression over here. So I'm not a big user of compression. Like I, I honestly don't use compression at all, to be honest. I sometimes use it, but it's like really slim. And, but basically that's what my mixing is about. And how do I know where to put everything? Mr. EQ match over here. I still use ozone 8s because I love doing this, for example, and knowing exactly where to know where to go to, but which it doesn't have in, in match EQ from ozone 9. But Leo, should I get ozone 9? Yes, 100% yes. Like it's one of the best mastering uh, mastering uh, plugins that I that I that I that I that I use. Everything will be here in the description be below afterwards, so make sure to check it over here. There will be probably some affiliate links, so if you use the affiliate links, it helps the channel a little bit as well. And it's a way to, 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 to come to sweets exactly a metal. Um, but basically, that said, that's my mixing project. And you can see that, again, as I, as I told you, th when I go to this project, I'm not focusing on creation. I'm not like, this is done. And the idea is, is to exactly not be able to create anything and not be able to tweak that lead and not be able to tweak that 0.1% over there. It's to just go with audio and tweak and mix itself. Okay. Are all the stem exported, uh, at minus 12 or minus six? Uh, the stems are exported. Uh, I'd say that again, as long as they're not clipping, that's what matters to me. Okay. You can see that this one is probably not at minus 12. Let me see it over here. Oops, this has to go off. This hits at minus two. Yeah, something like this with, with the master. Yeah, minus two over here. So uh, as long as it's not clipping again, I can control everything with this one afterwards. OK, I can control what goes. I don't just don't want this band to clip. And it's not I don't want this band to clip. Afterwards over here, I don't want this bus to clip, nor this bus, but yeah, do I normalize uh, when you bounce? No, I don't. These are my bouncing settings. I just use no dither, beat depth of 24, uh, file type always waves, 44, 1, and I don't normalize it. Um, I always encode PCM. Um, basically that's it is if you're using Ableton, I'm, I'm sure that you can translate this into DAW as well, but 
any other questions i hope that you've been taking a lot of good insights from this and it's been really cool to have you all on board if you're new to the channel you can hit the like button over here you can subscribe i post a lot of tutorials over here as well and again i'll be i will be posting more um uh, walkthroughs and more progressions i'm i'm getting some artists as well uh to be doing some progress some walkthroughs as well so it'll be a lot more stuff so if you want to subscribe to the channel, it really helps the channel a lot. Leave a like here in the video. It helps the video a lot again. And I meant before the mastering process, when you export the stems, again, fly by cuts free. As long as this is uh, not uh, clipping, that's what matters to me. I don't, just don't want them to clip, period. There's no like minus six or minus two. Because again, let's say I export everything to minus 0.3. Okay, it's not even, I just, I can just come here, select everything and put everything down in minus 10 and bam, I've solved all my problems. Like I don't need to be that specific with minus six or minus 12 because it doesn't, uh, it doesn't really affect the project, the process itself, you know? And if I, let's say again, this was, I'm going to be at like two over here. So this is almost like clipping. You can see it over here. It's almost clipping. But again, if I just come here and introduce a an utility and bring it down to minus 10, that's what matters to me. Oh, I'm, I'm really glad to, I'm, I'm really glad that this was really informative fly by years. Again, if you're not subscribed to the channel yet, subscribe it so you don't miss out. Um, and I'm really happy to have you all here, dudes. I'm really excited to have you all here. It was really a pleasure. If you guys have any questions, you can just go on Discord, ask me directly over there, uh, or you can go on Facebook, or you can just come to this video, ask a question, and I'll answer afterwards. Um, oh, I'm really glad to listen to this. And uh, thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for everything. Hope you're liking this. Again, if you like this kind of walkthroughs, let me know because I'm probably gonna do more of them. I'm getting more artists to do walkthroughs as well. So it would be really nice to have uh, your input if that's something that you'd love to have. I'm talking to some big artists and coming into the channel. So hopefully they will accept my calls. And the more people that watch this, the more people we can convince to come here to the channel, okay? So spread it out. Now it's not Caipirinha time, Amado, it's Coke, Coca-Cola, okay? I, I don't do anything illegal. It's just my usual Coca-Cola. Uh, catch you all later. And again, thank you so much for being here. I really, really, really appreciate all and every one of you. Thank you so much. And I hope to see you in the next abstract video, probably Tuesday, there will be a production video here. So don't miss out on that. And I hope to see you soon. Are you on Discord? Yes, I'm on Discord. You can all find me on Discord over here. This is my tag on Discord. Just add me there. I talk to everyone and I probably talk a lot more. Probably everyone knows that I talk a lot over there. So feel free to reach out. I'll, I'm always there. And yeah, love being here. Love that oh, everyone was here. Love that the attendance was really good at all times. So I really appreciate it. Thanks Sakura again for everything. Um, thanks Sakura for releasing this song and thank you Sakura for, for the live stream, for allowing us to do the live stream as well. And thank you so much for being all here. I love that you were here all the time asking questions and being particip participative. Yes, that's the word. And yeah, hope you all have a good end of your Sunday wherever you are in the world. And I hope to see you next in the next abstract video. Cheers.